What is 19th century nature philosophy? And what should Christians think of Richard Owen's vertebrate archetype? G'day, Ken Colson here again for part three. Uh, it's been a while since uh, we've done a video on the fossil sequences. What support is there uh, from a Darwinian evolutionary perspective? So here is part three. Go back and watch parts one and two. You'll find the links in the description. They got a ton of information in them uh, that you'll want to watch in order to sort of get an idea of what's going on in this video. So. First of all, let us just quickly, quickly recap on something that's really, really important, especially uh, with a lot that's going on in creationism at the moment. And that is the idea of uh, calling uh, some dinosaurs birds and identifying them with modern birds instead of calling them dinosaurs. So I talked about this in great depth in the other two videos. Go back and watch them. But essentially, uh, you've got two critters here. On the on the left, you have got Archaeopteryx, and on the right, you've got Cynosauropteryx. Uh, Cynosauropteryx, the one on the right, is a, a land-dwelling cursorial dinosaur, a theropod dinosaur. It did not fly. Uh, it probably didn't have any feathers, although some people think that it did have some kind of proto-feathers. Um, but it was a, uh, a land-dwelling animal for sure. The one on the left, Archaeopteryx, uh, had fully developed feathers and wings and was capable of powered flight. And uh, so essentially what's going on uh, in creationist circles is uh, because Archaeopteryx, the one on the left, has feathers and it flies, a lot of creationists want to, want to call it a bird. In other words, today we have birds, and birds have feathers, and they fly, so therefore it is a bird. But this is really inconsistent from a creationist perspective. So, uh, for example, all creationists that I know will call uh, a whale a mammal. Um, now, uh, you know, before I think it was Linnaeus classified it as a mammal, it was called a fish. And the reason it was called a fish is because it, like other kinds of fish, uh, so just a regular fish. It swam in the ocean, had flippers and everything else, and so people just called it a fish. But Linnaeus and other scientists uh, adopted uh, the whale into the mammal group, and so uh, all creationists that I know call whales mammals. They don't call them fish, even though it has fins and it swims in the ocean like other fish. Well, to be consistent, We've got to do that with these skeletons as well. Just because it has feathers and wings and flies, we can't call it a bird, just like we don't call a whale uh, a fish, just because it has flippers and it swims in the ocean. It's based on the skeletal structure, is how modern science identifies these things. And since creationists call whales mammals, they have, by virtue of that designation, they've adopted modern forms of taxonomy so we can't sort of change the rules halfway through. Uh, the fact is, when you look at the skeleton of Archaeopteryx, the one on the left, and Cynosauropteryx, the one on the right, you can see that the skeletons are very, very similar. The one on the right, everyone agrees, is a dinosaur. So therefore, based on the similarity of skeletal information, we should call the one on the left, Archaeopteryx, a dinosaur as well, even though it flew. Now, there are some uh, differences, and you can see those differences in the hand. So in the Manus, uh, you know, you've got digits, uh, digits one, one, two, and three. So digits one, two, and three. They've got those three digits. They've got a semilunar uh, carpal uh, bone as well, which allows the wrist to pivot, and that's necessary for flight. And uh, those parts actually are, are quite similar to modern birds. But the rest of the skeleton is actually very, very similar to Cynosauropteryx. So um, just from a skeletal perspective, we need to be calling Archaeopteryx a dinosaur. Otherwise, if we're going to call it a bird because it flies, then we should also call a whale a fish. So I hope that makes sense. Anyway, let's kind of move on. Um, so uh, when we got together last time, we looked at uh, this sequence. 
Uh, so this was kind of the thing that I finished on last time. And, and I mentioned that uh, we looked at the fossil record and we saw that truly, uh, from a fossil record perspective, there are some serious problems with an evolutionary perspective. Th uh, fossils are definitely out of place. And go back and watch those videos um, if you're not convinced about that. We also saw things like uh, fully flighted animals like Archaeopteryx turn up in the fossil record without any precursor uh, feathers. So you don't have any, there's no evolution of the feather in the fossil record. You essentially go from nothing and then you have fully flighted feathers just turning up. Now, all the so-called transition feathers, uh, proto feathers that uh, paleontologists talk about, they're all there, but they're actually all in either the same layers or layers that are higher up. So just from a fossil perspective, some real issues from an evolutionary perspective. But we did come up with this problem, and that is there does seem to be sort of a sequence uh, when you look at just the skeletons of these organisms. So on the right, so here, so this is a Sinusoptrix again, and here is Archaeopteryx again. And, uh, you know, we looked at just briefly, we just quickly looked at these two skeletons and we saw that they're very, very similar to each other, even though one flies. Um, and over here uh, is a bird. Now, let me just take that away for a minute. Here's a bird. That's actually a chicken. And when you look at the skeleton of a chicken and the skeleton of these two, you can see some similarities. But I think there's a there's a fairly big difference between these two skeletons and this skeleton over here. But if I was an evolutionist, um, I would hypothesize that uh, since I believe, I mean, I'm not an evolutionist, right? I'm hypothesizing as an evolutionist. You would believe if uh, some sort of dinosaur theropod is the primitive uh, type, then and we're evolving into birds, then you would hypothesize that there would be some kind of intermediate between Archaeopteryx and between birds. That's what you would hypothesize. And in fact, that's what they did hypothesize. And in fact, that's what they actually found. Um, so uh, this is um, a fossil, uh, the, the bone structure of a, uh, a, a bird called Confuciusornis. So Confuciusornis, uh, it's an avialin uh, flying dinosaur. And um, when you look at it, it, it certainly has a lot of intermediate type um, characteristics. So, for example, uh, if you look at the hand structure, so here's Archaeopteryx. It has the Archaeopteryx again has the one, two, three fingers. It has the the semilunate carpal bone, but the hand structure in Confuciusornis is also really, really similar to that of Archaeopteryx, and it has a lot of other skeletal uh, bits and pieces that are also similar to Archaeopteryx. For example, Archaeopteryx has these gastralia and um, Confucius Saunus also has gastralia. Well, you can see the chicken, it does not have gastralia, a kind of uh, sort of bones uh, that you'll see down here in the chest, in the chest region. So um, definitely has those characteristics in common with Archaeopteryx, but it also has some uh, features in common with um, birds. And you can see one of them that sticks right out, of course, is his piger style. Uh, so it has a piger style, and in fact, when you look at it in the flesh, so to speak, sort of an artist rendition, it does look a lot like a bird. Uh, but you can see why an evolutionist would look at this series and conclude that originally you had theropod-like organisms that slowly evolved into flying theropods, and then they got more bird-like, and eventually you got to birds. And this is really, really important for creationists to understand. Number one, because uh, a lot of creationists just outright deny it, and uh, that's not going to go very far with anyone who is sort of thinking through these things. And of course, now this kind of information gets uh, into the school system, colleges, quite easily. And so don't be surprised if this kind of information comes up. And so we need to deal with this from a creationist perspective. Now, some other things that are of interest about this kind of uh, concept of a sequence. Um, if I took, so here, if I took uh, this one, Confucius Saunus, and I turned it and I, and I slotted it over here, and I put Archaeopteryx over here, you can see that it doesn't make a good sequence anymore. Uh, it's pretty obvious that Archaeopteryx is closer to the, the Sinusroptrix. That's pretty clear. So you can't do this. Um, you, you know, if I did the same thing here with uh, 
uh, Archaeopteryx and put it up the front of the line and put the chicken behind and then put Confucius on us here and Sinusoropteryx here, you can see that doesn't make sense either. In other words, I think that this concept of a sequence is real. I think it's a, a real concept. This idea of a sequence is something that seems quite real, uh, where there does seem to be a skeletal progression and it seems to be going in a certain direction. Now, what you could do is you could turn them all around. So either the uh, skeletal progression can either go to the, it can either go to the left. Okay. So sort of progressing to the bird-like skeleton or um, it could go to the right. Whoops. So it could go to the left or it could go to the right and it could progress to the more sinusoroptrics like skeleton. Um, but you can't take the fossils and sort of stick them in between. It's got to be either one way or the other. So um, I just think this is a, I think it's real. I think it's something that's real. And I think it's something that creationists uh, really need to be thinking about. And, um, you know, if I put in other creatures, you can really see this distinction. So this is the skeleton of a kangaroo. And um, you can see that the bone structure and the way the whole anatomy is, is absolutely, completely a distinct from either the dinosaurs on the right or the bird on the left. Uh, clearly, the kangaroo stands out as a very, very different kind of organism. Um, and if I stick in a chimpanzee, um, the same thing. You can clearly see that um, the chimpanzee and the kangaroo stand out, um, which means there's something else going on here we need to talk about, and that is kind of the idea of a nested hierarchy. And that is that um, groups of animals, which creationists would call separate created kinds, have a very, very similar structure. Uh, so let me go back to this picture over here. So here is this picture again, and, and you can see looking at these organisms, you know, unlike, you know, when you stick a kangaroo in there, or unlike when you stick a chimpanzee in there, you can see that they all seem to have a common structure. And you, you could see putting all of these into a single group. Certainly you could, you could put these three, this one, whoops, Certainly, you could put these three, Confucius Saunus, Archaeopteryx, and Sinusoroptrix. Skeletally, you could stick them into a group. And uh, even though we know um, that these are three different created kinds from a creationist perspective. And so we want to start looking at some of these uh, questions that we have. One is this concept of um, sort of progressive skeletal form. The other is the concept of sort of transitions, because there does seem to be sort of a transition in here. And uh, the third one we want to look at is the concept of nested hierarchies. And that is, there seems to be a group here of organisms uh, that are different from other groups. Why is that? So that's what we're going to look at in this video. Now, of course, um, when we bring up these kinds of questions, the most common uh, sort of a solution that I hear from creationists is the idea of common design. Well, that's just common design. And I think that this is a legitimate way of looking at this. I think common design is a good way of looking at it. We have one God, and of course, one God is going to make things very similarly. But think about what common design is. What If someone says to me, that's common design, how does common design, how does it answer the concept of progression in skeletal forms. How does common design answer, you know, answer or solve the problem of a transition? And how does it answer or solve the problems of nested hierarchies? Why are there different groups of organisms that have the same kind of structure? That is where common design falls short. And so we need to be thinking outside the box uh, a lot more about this. Uh, now, before we go any further, we do need to talk about homology because uh, this comes into play when we're talking about evolution and when we're talking about common design. So here you've got uh, the, uh, looks like the forearm of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different organisms. You've got a bird, a bat, a whale, a cat, a horse, and a human. And the little uh, chart there at, at the top uh, is telling you what each, the colors are telling you what each of the bones are. So you've got a humerus and ulnar, metacarpals and phalanges. And what's interesting is, 
is that all of these different organisms, which from a creationist perspective would represent six different created kinds, they all have the same bones. Now the bones are different shapes, the different lengths, but they all have the same bones. And uh, that's really interesting. And of course, that, that captured the attention, or actually it's been capturing the attention of scientists and philosophers for, as we'll see, thousands of years. Why is that? Um, so what is, uh, so what, what has, what do sort of scientists, uh, uh, secular scientists think about this? Well, they believe in something called homology. And homology means that the reason all of these different organisms have the same initial bone structure is because they all have a common ancestor from the past and they all evolved from that common ancestor. So for example, here is some sort of ancient archosaur. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, but it supposedly evolves. It has a wrist structure, a forearm structure, uh, just like we have today. Um, it has all of these bones. And um, as this common ancestor, uh, the groups of this common ancestor evolve and change over time, uh, the different uh, the different groups that evolve from this common ancestor, so the descendants, uh, there that the form of the forearm changes. Some adapt flight. Some adapt for swimming, others for running, others for holding things, and the bones don't change, but the shapes of the bones do change. That is the way in which uh, a secular scientist will answer that question. Now, of course, from a creationist perspective, uh, is that necessarily the only answer? Uh, do homologous structures necessarily indicate common descent? And I would say no. Um, I would say you could uh, you could look at these uh, these specifically in terms of common design. So this is actually where the the the, the uh, phrase common design is very useful, because um, it only makes sense that if God was going to create uh, lots of different kinds of vertebrates uh, on a on a plan, a tetrapod sort of a plan, so you've got you know arms and legs, it only makes sense that he would adapt each of the bones and change them to suit the functions which uh, those organisms are going to carry in the environment. Um, and so it makes sense why, you know, sort of why rock the boat here? Uh, it ain't broke. Uh, so, you know, why try to fix something that's not broke? God has a basic plan, uh, a vertebrate plan. He uses that vertebrate plan for lots of different animals. But as I said, um, it does not uh, answer the question about uh, sort of a sequential skeletal uh, series, it doesn't answer the question of transitions, and it doesn't answer the question of nested hierarchies, and that's what we want to look at in this uh, in, in this part. And actually, there's going to be a fourth part on this as well. Um, and again, uh, this concept of nested hierarchies, uh, it's real. Um, here is the skeleton of a chimpanzee and the skeleton of a human, and you can see that these skeletons are incredibly different than these skeletons you can see that these skeletons are also built on some kind of a plan that's very, very different to these ones over here. In fact, you could take uh, skeletons of any of these uh, primates and they would all be very, very similar to these skeletons. Very, very similar when you look at them. And hence, you know, uh, evolutionists believing that this is actually an evolutionary sequence again. Um, so this is another nested hierarchy. It's another structural uh, uh, structural skeletal form um, that is shared uh, over several different created kinds and um, again we need to be answering that question. Okay so again here seems to be the issues that we have. Uh, skeletal sequences, apparent skeletal sequences, um, apparent transitions and nested hierarchies. There are some three very very important questions that we need to be talking about. Now, some caveats here. Uh, it is important to realize that although, for example, here is the skeleton of a crow and the skeleton of a chicken, um, although uh, the skeletons are really, really similar. Uh, in fact, if you, if you just don't look at the head uh, and look at the actual skeleton, they're almost identical. And, um, you know, if you're not a trained uh, anatomist, you know, you could you could see these two skeletons as being almost identical. But when you when you look at the critters with flesh on, you can see that they're very different. So uh, you can see the the picture of the crow and the picture of the chicken. Uh, obviously, uh, these are two separate created kinds. No problem 
understanding that, even though their skeletons are really, really similar. So uh, it is important for us to realize that although, this, although skeletons can be really, really similar, that doesn't mean the organisms that had flesh on them actually looked very, very similar. They may have looked very, very different, although they certainly would not uh, they, they certainly would look very, very different than, say, a kangaroo or a chimpanzee or some other structural plant. And that's true with the dinosaurs as well. So we've got Archaeopteryx again on the left and Sinusteropteryx on the right. And although the skeletons are very similar, again, and of course these are extinct, so we don't really know, but these are artists' impressions of what these creatures looked like. And you can see looking at the artist's representation, they're very different. And I think that would be true those creatures would have looked very different. After all, one's got a full set of wings and feathers and the other one doesn't. And so here is our sequence again, I'll, only this time I've, I've replaced the chicken with a crow. And um, you've got the, the, the creatures with their flesh on above. Here's actually, this is what Confucius Saunus, an artist's rendition of what Confucius Saunus looked like. You can see that it's got, it, well, you can't see it there. Actually, I'm not sure if Confucius Saunus does have teeth. I, I think it doesn't have teeth, but um, it does have claws right? That's those three fingers coming through again. Um, and again, it has a lot of other um, skeletal things in similar with, uh, that are uh, that it shares with uh, Archaeopteryx over here. But you can see looking at the creatures with flesh on, so to speak, that you sort of look different. Okay, so that's kind of a caveat. But this concept, though, of sort of a sequence or sequen sequential skeletal similarity or st a structural similarity, it's not just me. Um, that's been saying this. In fact, this is something that philosophers have been discussing for thousands of years. Um, and it's, it's just, unfortunately, it's been something that has really just not been discussed in creation circles, I mean, at all. Uh, I didn't find out about this until I just started digging into some 19th century scientists. It's almost as though uh, creation, modern creationism has cut it off and uh, doesn't want anything to do with it. But it is a real phenomena. Uh, a phenomenon and um, something discussed by other creationists. So here's a paper that was published for the International uh, Conference on Creationism in 2018. And uh, the authors were uh, Matt McLean, uh, Matt Patrone, and Matthew Spites. And um, this is what they said in that paper regarding this concept of sort of uh, sequential series. They said, traditionally, creationists have considered dinosaurs and birds to be two discrete groups. And remember uh, that this is a real issue that's going on in creationism right now. You know, you've got creationists trying to keep birds and dinosaurs discrete and separate. And it's really for philosophical reasons, right? Because they feel like the Bible's under attack. Um, and I don't think it is, but they feel that it is. And so I appreciate what they're trying to do. But as I said earlier, is not the right approach. But anyway, they say, um, consider dinosaurs and birds to be two discrete groups, easy to separate and identify. To most people, dinosaurs and birds appear to be vastly different animals. However, such a distinction can only be maintained by cherry-picking non-bird-like dinosaurs for comparison. For instance, if sparrows, eagles, and flamingos are compared with Triceratops, Diplodocus, and Stegosaurus, and Diplodocus is kind of like a big, a big sauropod, uh, think Brachiosaurus, Jurassic Park, it is obvious that the birds belong to a different group for, uh, from the dinosaurs. A much different picture appears if we compare birds to the theropod dinosaurs and especially to the uh, smaller cellarosaurs. Uh, the similarities are progressive from cellarosaurs to living birds, creating an anatomical spectrum of features. Remember, that's what we just talked about. And De Long is not very similar to Corvus. Now, De Long is uh, sort of like a tiny T-Rex. Uh, that's, that's kind of the idea anyway. Uh, but it's a theropod dinosaur, mediating theropod dinosaur. And it's not very similar to Corvus. That's true. And Corvus is living crows. But De Long is similar to Compsognathus. Now, Compsognathus is essentially the same thing as the Sinusoroptrix skeleton that I had earlier in the presentation. So De Long and Compsognathus are really similar. Uh, Compsognathus, well, that's very, very similar to Deinonychus. And Deinonychus is, uh, you think of that, it's a dromaeosaur and it's a raptor. Uh, a, a raptorial dromaeosaur that most likely had feathers. But from a skeletal perspective, Compsognathus and Deinonychus are very, very similar. Deinonychus is very, very similar to Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx is similar to Cathay Ornus, which is, uh, uh, it's basically very, very similar to a modern bird, except it had, uh, had uh, claws and it had teeth. 
and it had some other differences as well. And none of them are actually uh, extant. They're all extinct. Um, but these are enantiornithine birds. Uh, but they did have a piker style. So anyway, uh, Cathayornis is close to Ichthyornis, which is actually even closer to modern birds. Uh, they still had claws. They still had uh, teeth. Um, uh, a toothed uh, ornithorine bird without claws. And Ichthyornis is close to Corvus, and Corvus is the crow. These similarities are not merely subjective. When the skeletal features are mathematically quantified and patterns of similarity analyzed as in our study, no enormous gulf can be found between cellarosaurs and birds. Um, none of these analyses included feathers, which means these patterns are present even aside from the discovery of feathers on small dinosaurs, which only heightens the degree of similarity. Now, this is super, super important because uh, this recognition is just, I'm just astonished. It's just not spoken of in creationist circles. In fact, you can literally go onto large creationist sites and they will essentially, just like these authors say, they will deny this. They will, they will show you a triceratops and an eagle and say, look, birds have got nothing to do with dinosaurs. But is that being really fair? Is that being honest with the data? I think if we're going to be, uh, you know, truly honest with the scientific data, then uh, we need to be humble about these uh, similarities. We need to recognize them. We need to deal with them. Um, as creation. And I'm not sure we have all the answers here. I mean, look, we don't have all the answers. You'll find that going forward. But I think we're getting there. Um, but it, we, need to, we need to believe that there's a problem there first. We need to acknowledge the problem, not just try and uh, sort of uh, brush it under the carpet. That is not the right way to deal with this problem. This is a real problem, and we need to be honest about it as not just creationists, but as Christians who are honest with uh, the data. We are about truth, not hiding truth from people. Okay, so I want to look at this now from a sort of a 30,000 foot view, sort of zoom right out. Do we see continuity or do we see uh, sort of a progression in organisms at the pulled out view? And if we take extinct organisms and include them with extant organisms, so organisms that are living today, we do see this sense of continuity between organisms. So for example, here I've got fish. Uh, so we've got fish. This is tiktalic, uh, sort of a fishapod. It's extinct, supposedly a, a transitional fossil between fish and tetrapods. You've got amphibians here. Uh, and I've got a crocodile over here. You've got, uh, these are called uh, therapsids. This is a red panda. This is an orangutan and a human. T-Rex, Velociraptor over here, Archaeopteryx, and a crow. The point being, the animals that are most near to the crocodile would be more like the crocodile than the animals that are farther away from the cro crocodile. So for example, uh, if I put the human down here, and I put this fish up here where this amphibian is, and if I took the crow and put it here, all of those creatures are very different than the crocodile. And so when you look at these different arms in this diagram, it does seem as though the critters that are closer to the crocodile sort of approximate the morphology of the crocodile a little bit more. So we go from a crow, which is very different than the crocodile, to Archaeopteryx. Uh, so Archaeopteryx now is a little bit more like the Velociraptor, but it's also a bit like the crow still. The Velociraptor is a bit like T-Rex, but it's also like Archaeopteryx, but it's now starting to be very different than the crow. And then T-Rex is starting to be a bit more like the crocodile than either the Velociraptor, Archaeopteryx, or the crow is. So you can see a sense of continuity that exists uh, when you take extinct fossil organisms and place them with extant uh, animals that exist in the real world. Uh, over here, you've got mammals. So you've got a red panda, orangutan, and a human. These two are called therapsids. They're extinct animals. Uh, they used to be called mammal-like reptiles because apparently they have a lot of features in common with reptiles and mammals. We don't have them today. They're extinct. Now, I've got a gap here because Unlike the T-Rex and this amphibian here, I do think there's a quite a bit of a gap between crocodiles and therapsids. However, 
I think what I'm saying still holds true, and that is that if I put the human uh, down here, you can see that the crocodile is very, very different uh, than the human. The crocodile is more like this uh, therapsid here than it is to the human. And uh, the uh, panda over here is more like the orangutan, it's more like the therapsid than it is also to the crocodile. So again, you can see a sense of uh, continuity in the fossil record. Again, down here, you've got uh, these amphibians. I think this one's extinct. So you've got these amphibians. You've got Tiktaalik, which is sort of an in-between, uh, between a tetrapod and between a fish. And then you've got fish down here. If I took the fish and I put them next to the crocodile, you can see that the amphibian is much more like the crocodile in morphology than the fish is. And if I go up the sequence, I could say, uh, again, that this Tiktaalik is certainly like this fish. It's also a bit like this amphibian, but it's starting to look different than these fish down here. Uh, when I go to these amphibians, you can see that they share something in common, or they, they have a similar morphology to Tiktaalik, but they're very different than the fish. And they seem to approximate a morphology that's a bit closer to the crocodile. So um, don't get me wrong here. I am not saying that you can see precise continuity uh, in, these, in this diagram. What I am saying is that generally this does seem to be true. It seems to be something that's real. And certainly it reflects what we've been looking at with uh, just the theropod dinosaurs, uh, and Confucius Ornus and the crow and chicken skeletons that we looked at earlier. Now, uh, this is actually what we see in the present because all of those uh, uh, extinct organisms I've removed. And now you can see some real discontinuity. And this is the way that our minds have been shaped because this is what we're familiar with. We're familiar with red pandas and gorillas and humans and crocodiles and fish and amphibians and birds, but we're not really, uh, we're, we're not connected with all of these extinct organisms. Uh, it's only just recently, it really in the last sort of 30, 40, 50 years with the advent of TV that we've become familiar with some of these extinct organisms. But for thousands of years, humans really have only had what you see on this slide to gauge uh, the, the concept of discontinuity in nature. So when you look at this slide, you can see discontinuity. But in reality, when you add the extinct organisms, you can see a sense of continuity. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed. Okay, so first of all, we need to recognize that this idea of a pattern or a gradation in biological forms, it's not new. It's been around for thousands of years. Socrates, Plato, and uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle uh, all had these kinds of ideas. And this is a, a diagram that represents what Aristotle thought. He, he came up with a term called scalar naturae and the scale of nature. And uh, he drew a diagram, some, something like this, where you have inanimate objects at the bottom and uh, there's an increasing compl complexity as you go up the steps towards man who is the most complex being. Uh, so here you've got, for example, you've got a clock and a hammer and a bell. And then on the next level, you've got, looks like rocks over here. And then here's a mushroom. So obviously a little bit more complex. Uh, then you go up again, you've got plants. And then here you've got, uh, looks like you've got corals. You've got some mollusks, some echinoderms, uh, which are the starfish here. Then you've got insects. And on this one, it looks like you've got some crustaceans and uh, a mollusk there, a squid. And I don't know what that is. Uh, you've got a shark on the next level, an amphibian, which is a, a frog, and then this uh, a turtle. And then uh, you've got mammals and birds here, and then man is right at the top. Okay, so let's move on now to Plato. It's going to be important for what we talk about. So uh, Plato, uh, he also believed in that scalar nature, right? Um, but he, he, he viewed reality essentially as two different realms. Um, he had a non-physical realm and a physical realm. And so in this picture, you can see there's a blue earth and a green earth. And in his, his idea was that there was a non-physical reality that existed 
or that exists in the mind of God. And uh, there is also a physical reality, which is the earth that we're standing on, that exists here in the present. And there were some very, very important distinctions between the two. So this was uh, the, the world that existed, or the reality that exists in the mind of God, was non-physical, it was non-extended, which means uh, had no uh, depth or breadth, uh, um, so no, no dimensions. Uh, it was eternal, it was immutable, which means it, it never changed, it was perfect, and it was necessary, which means it had to be there. Uh, then there was uh, the reality that exists here and now, which is physical, it's extended, which means it has dimensions. Um, it's uh, transient, which means it can go out of existence here, but it can never go out of existence in the uh, non-physical realm. It's mutable, which means it can change. It's imperfect, and it's contingent, which means it can go out of existence uh, whilst the, the form or the idea that exists in the mind of God cannot. And so uh, Plato then thought that everything that is in our world has some kind of representative idea or form that exists in the mind of God. And these forms were perfect. Uh, so a good example of that would be a sphere. So the ancient Greeks really liked things that were round uh, and they liked spheres. And so Plato would uh, see a sphere and understand a sphere in the uh, the physical extended world that we live in as being almost perfect. I mean, you could get really close to perfection, uh, but you could never get a perfect sphere. That only existed in the mind of God. So using some modern parlance, you know, we could take a scanning electron microscope, we could uh, take our sphere, and we could kind of drill down, uh, you know, 10,000 times, and no matter how good we made our sphere, and it doesn't matter what substance we made it out of, there'd be little pits in the surface. It wouldn't be perfect. Only a perfect sphere uh, can exist in the mind of God in the, uh, as an idea or as a form. And so everything that exists has an idea or a form. And so here's an example. In this example, uh, you've got a horse. That's this horse right here, and it's in this box which means the forms. These are the forms that exist only in the mind of God. That's the perfect form of a horse. And uh, you have the perfect form, but in the physical world, the, the world that we have, we only have particulars. And so here you've got uh, a couple, three horses, right? Forget about the lady here uh, for a moment. So you've got these three horses. And these three horses each contain some element, uh, some characteristic, uh, that is true of the form, uh, of the eternal, perfect form that exists in the mind of God. And so he says they have instantiated some aspects of this uh, perfect form. But uh, they're not perfect themselves. They're only representatives of this perfect form. And each of them uh, only has certain characteristics of the perfect form. If you go and take all the horses that we have, that's a good way to be able to try and describe the perfect form. As many of these objects as you can get uh, would get you closer and closer and closer to what the perfect form looked like. So anyway, that was Plato's idea, uh, Plato's model, and that is that everything had forms or ideas that exist in the mind of God, whether they're uh, inanimate, uh, whether they're living, and even abstract, so things like beauty or things like courage, also had uh, a perfect form or idea that existed in the mind of God. Okay, so that's important for where we're going to go next. So uh, Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, their ideas really permeated, uh, the, uh, they did and they continue to permeate uh, the world uh, and have been for 2,500 years. Uh, but Plato's ideas and Aristotle's ideas as well really played a big role in formulating ideas and concepts in the minds of early Christians, the early Christian fathers, and um, the Middle Ages, and of course the scientists of the 18th uh, and 19th centuries. Especially in the 18th and 19th centuries, a lot of these ideas really began to permeate the sciences. So I want to talk now about the nature philosophers. So the nature philosophers were a group of eclectic uh, scientists, early scientists, 
uh, of course back then they're just called naturalists uh, from the 17 from the 1800s that they were these nature philosophers um, and this eclectic group uh, believed uh, or, or focused deeply on a lot of Aristotle's and Plato's uh, concepts these ideas and these forms and these nature philosophers uh, they were very very interested in the morphology of biological forms they wanted to know why a horse is shaped like a horse they wanted to know why a rabbit is shaped like a rabbit and so the concept of morphology biological morphology was very very important to these nature philosophers or early scientists and they were very influenced as, as i said by plato and by aristotle and so uh, they uh, were very focused on an idea called structuralism. So back in the 19th century, there were essentially two ways of uh, looking at biological form, either as a from a structural perspective or from something uh, called a functional perspective. So the functionalists, and, it got, and of course, again, everyone was interested in, in the idea of morphology because at the time, remember, uh, metaphysical ideas were important. They were worth something, and people really investigated these ideas. In fact, uh, these people published in the scientific literature on these ideas because they were interesting, and the science of the day was interested in what they had to say. And so you had a group called the Functionalists. And of course, I'm really uh, dumbing down things a lot uh, because there's a ton of information here, but basically, uh, the functionalists, they believed that biological form was a consequence of the function of an organism. So uh, the creator, because they all believed in a creator, or of course they had eclectic religious views, but they all believed in uh, the creator. And uh, they believed that the creator endowed biological form by virtue of its function. So, for example, the kind of teeth that it had, or its claws, or its paws, or, or, or something about the animal... Um, the way that it functioned, the way that God made it function so that it could exist in the real world. And each of these different functional aspects were called adaptations. So uh, teeth, for example, you had different kinds of adaptations. Now, back in those days, an adaptation was not something that evolved. An adaptation was something that God had given it. And uh, they believed that it was the function of the animals, it was the combination of all of their adaptations that gave the animal its shape. But the structuralists, that's the nature philosophers, they were different. They were captivated by Platonic and Aristotelian thought. And in, in their thinking, there was these perfect archetypes that existed in the mind of God. And so the creator then endowed different creatures with a overall structure. And it was the structure that was most important. Now, they, they, they did accept the importance of adaptations, of functional uh, distinctions. But in their minds, the morphology of the animals was deeply rooted in its structure. And the structure comes from the archetype, which exists in the mind of God. And so they would see this concept of nested hierarchy, and they would attribute that again, to a structuralist interpretation, whilst the functionalists would attribute those uh, differences to uh, uh, adaptations. Of course, um, I don't want to get into it too much, but the functionalists really struggled because of what we've already talked about, the idea of uh, sequential skeletal forms, the idea of s uh, apparent um, transitions, and the idea of nested hierarchies. The structuralists could really answer those questions well, but the, the functionalists couldn't. So uh, that's the nature of philosophers. That's the idea of structuralism. And, and, and just as an aside, uh, these ideas sort of uh, really began to spring forth in about the 1700s. And some of the most well-known structuralists uh, is Johann von Giert, uh, uh, Etienne Geoffroy St. Hilaire, uh, Carl Frederick von Baer, and of course, Richard Owen, who we'll talk about briefly. And as I said, um, these people... Uh, certainly the ones living in the 19th century, so into the 1800s, we would call them nature philosophers. Nature philosophy didn't really get going until sort of the early to mid 1900s, uh, but people were already thinking that way in the 1700s.
And so uh, this was some of the, th these are some of the early uh, nature philosophers, some of the early structuralists, and they had eclectic views. Uh, some were deists, some were pantheists, some were committed Christians uh, to Orthodox Christianity. Others were sort of uh, had a kind of a liberal view of Christianity. So they were sort of all over the place with respect to a religious uh, religious convictions. Okay, so moving on. So um, in the 18th century, so in the 1700s, uh, you know, as I said, people were starting to talk about archetypes. They wanted to understand how different creatures had a particular kind of morphology. And it's about that time that interest in um, comparative anatomy began. And comparative anatomy was actually uh, initially uh, focused on this, on, on resolving this issue of morphology. Of course, it's much different today, but back then it was like, why are these organisms so similar? These were the big questions. And the first person to think of an archetype, at least for the vertebrate form, uh, was actually a guy by the name of Robinette, uh, and he wrote a book sometime in the mid to late 1700s, and he said this, uh, he said that all beings have been conceived and formed on one single plan, the metamorphosis of which are to be considered as so many steps toward the most excellent form of being, which is a human. So he was one of the first people to really put forward the idea of a human archetype, at least for the vertebrates. Uh, and then we get Richard Owen. Richard Owen is kind of the uh, primary thinker in these in these areas. So Richard Owen, uh, he was a committed Christian, uh, a committed Orthodox Christian. He was a creationist. Uh, he didn't believe in transmutation, what was called transmutation at the time, which was Darwin's theory. Uh, and uh, he was an old earth creationist, mind you. He was not a young earth creationist. He was an old earth creationist. But Owen, again, influenced by Plato and Aristotle and the church fathers and, uh, you know, the medieval uh, writers, because uh, they were all talking about these things. He uh, thought of the archetype in terms of uh, some conceptual vertebrate that existed in the mind of God. And this picture that you see on your screen here is that conceptual vertebrate. He uh, drew this conceptual vertebrate, uh, and he basically said, and he published this uh, in a book in uh, in um, 18, uh, 1849 called On the Origin of Limbs. Very, very well received book. He wrote papers on these things. I mean, this was something that people took seriously. And he said, look, all vertebrates, at least vertebrates, have a archetype, and this is the archetype. I've discovered it. Here it is. And this is a picture of the archetype. And in his mind, uh, all other vertebrates essentially uh, come through addition of, of distinctive parts. So as you add certain parts to the archetype, you get different kinds of vertebrates until you get to the uh, premier archetype, which was a, a human. And he, he, he says that. So I'm going to quote him now. He says, Now, however, the recognition of an ideal exemplar, and that, by the way, is the archetype that you see on your screen, for the vertebrate animals proves that the knowledge of such a being as man must have existed before man appeared. For the divine mind which planned the archetype also foreknew all its modifications. So the way he looked at it, um, and remember, he's an old earth creationist, God creates these very, very basic uh, creatures, to begin with, and they're early in the fossil record, and they are themselves built on this conceptual vertebrate archetype. However, over time, from an old earth creationist perspective, God progressively creates more complex vertebrates until you get to the ultimate uh, uh, vertebrate, which is uh, man. But in Owen's mind, the archetype was not human, which is interesting because the previous author from the 1700s did think that the archetype was human. And in fact, Plato himself thought that um, uh, the vertebrate archetype was also uh, a human form. Now, also interestingly, um, uh, Owen built his archetype on uh, kind of a, a sequence of uh, vertebrae. And so here I've got a picture of a vertebra. And Owen's thought was, and it wasn't just Owen, uh, there was Ni uh, Geoffroy St. Hilaire. Uh, he uh, also conceptualized an archetype built from a single vertebra. And there were other uh, of these early uh, nature philosophers, structuralists, 
who thought that the postcranial skeleton with its vertebrae was kind of the central part of vertebrates. It was kind of like the, 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 the nuts and bolts of vertebrate was that the backbone, if you like. And therefore, um, if we're going to sort of, um, d uh, sort of diminish what the archetype is, it's not just, uh, it's not just a postcranial skeleton. It's actually a single vertebra. That is the archetype upon which everything is built. And so that is, uh, as I say, a lot of these early thinkers, they were thinking that, but it was actually uh, Richard Owen who formulated it all, who put it together, and who published it in books and in papers, and it was really, really well received. Now, interestingly, um, there were other people at the time who disagreed with uh, Owen and disagreed with uh, uh, Geoffroy uh, St. Hilaire. Um, these people thought that the archetype was actually a human, actually uh, uh, some sort of conceptual atom. Uh, so this is what this guy, uh, this guy's name is Joseph McLeese. He was a comparative anatomist. He was also a surgeon. And uh, he wrote this book, Morphological Studies, Archetype Skeletons of Vertebrated Animals. And this is what he says in his book. And he's anticipating uh, and objecting against uh, the idea that was put forward by Owen and some others earlier than him that the archetype is a vertebra. This is what he says. This is what we are to understand by the word archetype as hereafter made use of. It is this name which we shall apply to the primitive model of forms standing in series. To the, and it's, the Greek here is archetupos, and it just literally means archetype. To the archetupos of that series, and our task shall be to prove that a vertebra is not this archetype of the spinal skeleton axis any more than the capital of a column is the archetype of the serial colonnade. In other words, he's saying, look, this is ridiculous. How can you say that an archetype is a vertebra? The archetype must be the human form. That's the archetype. And uh, the way that he got uh, a different kinds of vertebrates was by subtraction. So for Owen, it was addition. Ad adding parts, you came up with different kinds of more progressive, uh, complex vertebrates that were created over you know millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years whatever he thought the age of the earth was at the time and culminating in man whilst for uh, this guy McLeese he thought that the ultimate archetype was a man and that God created all the different uh, vertebrates by subtracting characters till you get down to the more primitive forms so obviously for this guy the archetype was man must have been existing in the mind of God and God then used that model to, uh, through subtraction, to create all the different vertebrates. And I think a real take home here is that these guys, uh, both McLeese and Owen, were thinking in terms of continuity. So Owen, for example, had his idea, which is the archetype, and uh, here's the archetype, and in his idea, uh, God created different vertebrate uh, organisms through addition of characteristics. And Owen would have had no problem with the concept of continuity. He would have had no problem with the concept of transitional forms. He, he just, that wouldn't have been even on his radar. And in fact, a lot of people uh, in that day, and certainly earlier, they really didn't have an issue with transitional animals. They really didn't have an issue with the concept of continuity, and that's because they hadn't been assaulted with Darwinian evolution. We have been uh, really uh, conditioned to think against the idea of transitions, to think against the idea of continuity in nature by virtue of really our uh, philosophical background. If you're a creationist and you've been and you've grown up in a creationist home, then you've been told that evolution and is is evil. Uh, hopefully, you haven't been told it's evil, but you've been told it's not right and it's wrong. And of course, Darwinian evolution actually is. Um, but you've also been told things like there are no such things as transitions and continuity between organisms. Well, that sounds like a bad thing because that sort of smacks a bit like uh, evolution. Now, uh, uh, McLeese was different. He uh, thought that the archetype was a human, sort of a uh, conceptual atom, if you like, and that God 
uh, created or designed all the different vertebrates through subtraction. So a subtracting of different characters. But he would still have understood a sense of continuity. Again, he wouldn't have had any problem uh, with the idea of transitions. Because in his mind, in his model, that's exactly the way God had designed things in sort of a transitional or in sort of a sequential series. So he wouldn't have had any real problem with that. So a lot of people at that time in uh, the 19th century, and in fact, really for uh, since the time of Aristotle, had been thinking in terms of continuity. They had been thinking in terms of transitions, not from an evolutionary perspective, that wasn't even on their radar, but they were thinking through those things. And of course, Darwin also was familiar with these things. He was familiar with the idea of continuity. He was familiar with the idea of transitions between organisms. Go and read The Origin. It's a great read. Uh, but he uh, looked at nature. He saw transitions in nature of modern organisms uh, in different geographical relationships. And he saw that there were transitions. So he understood the concept of transitions. He would have understood the philosophy uh, behind continuity in organisms. And he wanted to explain that continuity. He wanted to explain uh, those transitions in terms of a non-metaphysical point of view. And of course, he came up with uh, his view of natural selection to answer these questions. So it's important for us to keep in mind then that continuity and transitions aren't necessarily a bad thing and that people had been thinking about these things even before Charles Darwin came along. Now, of course, as I said, Darwin was a materialist. He wanted to get rid of all metaphysical ideas. And so what he did is uh, he incorporated some of these ideas into his own into his own uh, book and into his own theory. In fact, Charles Darwin took uh, Richard Owen's archetype and actually incorporated it into his own model of natural selection. Of course, Richard Owen believed that the archetype was something that existed in the mind of God. Well, Charles Darwin didn't believe that, and so he said, "I want an archetype." And I like Richard Owen's archetype, but I'm going to make that archetype the ultimate common ancestor. In other words, uh, for vertebrates anyway. In other words, there is some kind of vertebrate ancestor upon which all other vertebrates are made or are designed. And of course, using materialistic processes. And in fact, uh, Stephen Jay Gould picked up on this and he says Darwin had struck a blow to the heart of Owen's system by substituting a flesh and blood ancestor, a concrete beastly thing for the lovely abstract platonic archetype. So Darwin then gave us another way of looking at an archetype, another way of looking at continuity, and another way of looking at transitions. And of course, since that time until the present, that has been the reigning paradigm. Uh, metaphysical ideas went out of favor really, really quickly after Darwin published his book on the origin of species. But as I've already suggested, there are some problems uh, with Darwin's view. In fact, there are lots of problems. We've already talked about the problems in the fossil record, that there are fossils that are out of place. I think that the model that uh, I'm going to propose uh, here can better answer questions of difficulty uh, that you find in Darwinian evolution. So for example, uh, you can, thinking in terms of teleology. Teleology is where an organism seems to be built or designed for a purpose. So for example, birds fly. But in order for birds to fly, they need certain adaptations. Remember we talked about the, that word adaptations. They need certain characteristics to help them fly. And just three of those characteristics, for an example, would be hollow bones, feathers, and it would be the uh, semilunate carpal bone uh, in their wrist that allows uh, the wrist to fold back and for the whole uh, wing actually to fold in. So they're three of many uh, characteristics or adaptations that birds need. However, those adaptations apparently already existed in theropods before you get flight from an evolutionary perspective. So somehow you've got hollow bones, 
you've got the semilunate carpal bone, you've got feathers, which are in non-flying organisms, right? They have other purposes. And then the term, by the way, is exaptation, uh, that, that through exaptation, uh, these three mechanisms or these three adaptations somehow learn to work together to produce flight. This is called teleology uh, because it seems as though uh, those adaptations converging for flight had some kind of intelligent design that was orchestrating or organizing that, teleolog that teleological end product. So that's a real problem for Darwinian evolution, and I don't think they've fully been able to answer how acceptation works really well, certainly in birds. And there are other problems as well. There is the problem of convergence or parallelism. Uh, so convergence is the idea that you have uh, different kinds of organisms that are on different separate evolutionary paths, and yet they evolve the same kind of feature. That, to me, is a real problem. And an example of that would be something like uh, dolphins, uh, sharks, and uh, an extinct ichthyosaur, which is a reptilian uh, swimming creature. They all have uh, adaptations that are clearly designed for swimming, and yet supposedly uh, in, an evolution, in a Darwinian evolutionary perspective, all of those different adaptations evolved separately in each of the three organisms. Um, and, and we're going to talk about that later. So I just think that's a real problem. Um, my point being, I think that when we think about continuity and even transitions from a purely Christian perspective, uh, it can answer the question of continuity. It can answer the question of transitions. It can, I believe, as I go forward, answer the problem of uh, hierarchical relationships. But then it also makes better sense of things like acceptations. It makes better sense of things like convergence or parallelism. And it makes better sense of what we've already seen, uh, where there are fossils out of place in the geologic record. So uh, that brings us to the end of part three. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, that video. There was a ton of stuff that we discussed uh, here. Uh, if uh, you like this video in any way, then please go ahead right now and hit that like button. I really, really appreciate it. It helps the algorithm along. Uh, uh, there's also a website, www.creationunfolding.com. I've got resources there, so go there and check that out. Uh, there's also a book if you're interested. Uh, look, I've got a donate button now as well. So there is a link in the description. Uh, you know, if you could donate in any way whatsoever, I'd really appreciate it. I'm, I'm sort of working more and more toward areas of research and away from uh, work, although I'm still working. Uh, I put a lot of time into this. Uh, so it'd be great uh, to get some financial uh, feedback if you like. But look, the greatest thing uh, that I would really desire from you is prayer. If you could pray for me, even just for five or 10 seconds right now, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you and goodbye.